Guess who is your chairman for this afternoon? Myself. So our next uh, speaker will be Mr. Dimitrios Haralambus. He will talk about keeping crew engaged during unprecedented times. Uh, Dimitris is the general manager of personal chief management. Dimitri, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, indeed, it's been, uh, there's no need to uh, emphasize that or to repeat that. It's been a tremendously uh, challenging times for um, manage, uh, managing crew. And uh, we, as a ship management company, uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you as well, have experienced that uh, issue firsthand. So um, it's been a, a while since we have this. Um, uh, COVID issue that we have to face. Um, of course, we, we know much more now than uh, we did uh, when this uh, pandemic uh, came up. Uh, still, there is a lot of uncertainty, and this is reflected uh, in the way uh, each country handles this um, uh, crew management issues differently. For example, we operate in Israel, and, and the rules are still changing uh, every now and then, and we also operate in Malta, and the rules are completely different than they are uh, in Israel. So there is a lot of uncertainty uh, at the moment. Uh, we do, though, have more options now that we had uh, some time uh, in the past. So we are much better off now than we were uh, some time ago. Um, I've been a seafarer myself in two different occasions. Uh, I call it part one and part two, and I've also been a shoreside manager on two occasions, part one, part two. So I will uh, try to, um, I've, I've been in both um, sides of the spectrum. I've been on board and I've also been at shoreside. So I will be changing my hats uh, whenever uh, is needed so that I can explain this subject as, uh, to the best of my knowledge. This is a part one uh, uh, being on board. So when I was a seafarer, that was uh, um, many years ago. And uh, keeping crew engaged at that time was completely different than it is uh, right now. For example, for those of you that uh, have not uh, uh, been, uh, that are younger than myself, you maybe don't know that. But at, in those days, we had no internet, so we had this discs that we had to take to somebody who was a radio officer uh, in, up in the, in the bridge. So basically, there was no other way to communicate uh, with uh, anybody outside the ship other than doing this process. So taking that disc, either with green fonts or maybe later on with just simple text, and go to the radio officer who would send the images to the, the messages to the office and then get the response at some time. So there was no internet, there were no mobile phones, there were no social media, there was no ISM, there was no MLC, there was no any requirement for STCWs. That was, in case you wonder and you think it's back in the 40s, it was not back in the 40s, I'm not that old. It was in 1993, 94, 96, somewhere there. So, I remember when I first joined uh, a ship, I didn't even have a STCW. I think the requirement at that point was that about 25% of the people on board should have this STCW or this basic safety training. So um, the company used to send a, a, an instructor so that we would reach that quota of 25% or whatever that percentage was at that stage. There was no safe manning requirement uh, there were no restrictions going ashore. Uh, you could be in the United States, you could just walk out. I don't think that's the case now, especially after September 11. So what I'm trying to say is that um, um, times have changed a lot. So the way we manage our crew and the way we engage our crew has uh, changed drastically. Uh, there was no alcohol consumption. I think today zero tolerance uh, never existed some uh, decades ago. 
and on a more, uh, I would say, uh, ship management side or, or from that angle, I think there was less dependence on the office, obviously, because of communication. Um, there was more knowledge and seamanship and leadership on board. Now uh, we are in the office, we, everything that happens on board, we need to guide them, we need to, I'm not sure if we do it wrong, rightly so or wrongly so, but we send them email messages to this, to that, send me that, don't do that. That was not the case at that point. So there was more knowledge on board, more seamanship and more leadership skills in my opinion. Uh, thus, officers and crew used to solve um, most of the problems themselves because that was a de facto situation pretty much. Um, also, the onboard jobs were, in my opinion, again, uh, less demanding and less complicated. Uh, again, there was not so much documentation, there was not so much interaction, so many rules, so many regulations, so it was uh, completely different. And I think as seafarers, we also had um, different expectations, less expectations than uh, probably seafarers have uh, nowadays. That was part B of my onboard life. Obviously, you can see that was a couple of decades uh, later on. Um, this, I just had these photos because I use them. Sometimes I'm asked to give some presentations uh, to students or um, uh, university students or students in, in high school students. And I, I cannot, uh, in, in regards to the blue career, and I cannot find any more effective way, in my own opinion, to show them that this kind of career is an option. And it can, for some of them, it can be a great opportunity and it can be an option. Of course, it's not for everybody, but for some people that they haven't thought about it, it, it could be an option. Because if I would become 23 again, I would do it all over again. So I had this photo, so I thought I'd show them to you to show the difference between the two different era of my onboard life. So now things have changed. It's, it's a completely new era, as I said before. Uh, seafarers uh, have a different profile than they used to. Um, they have different characteristics, different expectations. And I think as uh, managers, we need to approach this uh, in, a, in a completely different way. Um, this uh, slide, I, I feel very strongly about this specific uh, slide. I think, and again, I've been on board and I've been uh, ashore as well, so I could see uh, both sides. I was lucky enough to, see, to be able to see both sides. Uh, seafarers are the core of our operation. We may be in the office, we may be making uh, agreements, we may be sending email messages, we may have an amazing SMS system accredited by four different uh, companies and so forth. At the end of the day, the people on board are the ones that do the job for us. And, um, they are, we are as good as they are. So we are as good as our people on board are. So I think putting the right people at the right places, uh, it applies to shoreside management as well, but I think it applies even more on the ship. Um, as a company, uh, we have ships, we have uh, 12, 10, 15 people on board. If you have a good uh, uh, captain, a good chief officer, a good chief engineer, it's, it's half of the game won. So. I think we, uh, as uh, shoreside managers, we really need to understand that we are as good as our people on board are, and it's very, very critical that we get the right people on board. So this is what I just said before. Um, during that time, we faced, uh, I mean, uh, various, various challenges. I'm not gonna go into detail because I think they are most, most of them are self-explanatory and also most of them you probably have experience from your own uh, position as well. Um, we had flight limitations. Um, a recent example, we had uh, somebody from the Philippines. Uh, the, the, his flight was canceled once in May. The, the flight was canceled again in, in June. Um, and then we sent him, in July, we sent him back to the airport. Um, and his cancel was well, his flight was cancelled again. Um, so I'm going to keep it secret because Mr. Papa Vasiliu doesn't know. But I, they, when they called me from the airport, it was a 3,000 uh, euro flight. I said, just let the guy go because it just, you just cannot bring him back. It's just not fair to the seafarer. The worst thing, though, is that he was in business class and he was posting pictures on Facebook. <laughs> but anyway, Mr. Papa Vasiliu doesn't have a Facebook, so I think I'm safe. 
I was hoping you wouldn't. <laughs> um, flight cancellations with short notice, and it's not only the flight cancellation, it's also the fact that when we send the seafarer, just to use him as an example, to the airport, his initial flight was via, for example, Thailand. And then when the flight was canceled, his alternative flight had to be through Dubai, for example. And Dubai has different rules than Thailand, so it was just a, a, a nightmare. But again, um, you, I'm sure you've, you've been through that. So, As I said before, countries with different rules, um, constant changing of the rules. Now I think Israel is on the fourth uh, vaccine. So recently they asked us that not only do we have to send seafarers that are vaccinated, but they also have, have to have the third vaccine uh, before they are able to enter uh, the country. So again, uh, rules are changing uh, constantly. We have quarantine. Um, some countries have quarantine, has can some countries don't have. Sometimes it, it even depends on the person that gives you the permission uh, to, to send the crew if, as to whether you're going to have quarantine or not. Contract extensions and fatigue. I mean, this is self-explanatory. People had to stay on board for many uh, days. I think Andromache also stayed on board for many days, so she will give you her own perspective. I, I know that the, um, the, the ship that I used to work before, I joined Petronav, they had 93 days at sea without any, um, any day in port relocating from Southeast Asia to uh, the UK. So it's been a, a nightmare. Sometimes, again, when I was on board, we have four days at sea and it's like endless. So to have 93 days at sea, it's, uh, it's another uh, torture, another dimension. Um, there are people, the death of seafarers that uh, passed away. Um, maybe it didn't come to the media as much. But I know in on one cruise ship that I used to work, there were four people that died uh, in Mexico. So it's, it's, uh, and it affects every other crew member on board. And obviously, it's, uh, there's no need to dwell on that. Um, and then you also have the operation that is in jeopardy. And you have the commercial aspect that the show must go on. So um, it's a lot of factors that must be taken into consideration. And it hasn't uh, been easy. It's easier now, but it's not uh, as it used to be. And again, as I said before, there is still some uncertainty. Uh, rules are changing, so we don't know when and, and when these things will uh, be uh, normalized again. And then we have the issue with trainings, audits, inspections. Um, you get a three-month extension. Uh, some audits can be done um, uh, remotely. Some audits cannot be done. Then you have an SMS system where you have to do a physical uh, inspection by the marine superintendent, for example, but that's not uh, feasible. So it's a lot of challenges. Again, I'm sure you've all experienced this. Um, keeping crew engaged, I think uh, we, maybe with the exception of uh, cruise ships and cruise uh, uh, ship uh, seafarers that uh, maybe they have a little bit of a, an easier life than uh, the other uh, seafarers. I think it's not much we offer. Uh, we offer food, we offer internet, uh, we need to manage the workload so we don't burn them out. Um, we, we need to vaccinate them. I think the vaccination, it goes back to another uh, point that I will mention afterwards. You cannot be vaccinated and be able to travel abroad and at the same time you don't put the right amount of effort and time or expense so that you can also vaccinate your seafarers, uh, which makes them feel that you care. Um, so we try to do that. Uh, in Israel, it was easy. In Cyprus, it was a different challenge. It was still easy. In other countries, we didn't succeed. But at least, I think, as a ship management company and, and as ship owners, we need to try and, and do something for our seafarers which they will appreciate and which we would have done for ourselves. Uh, constant communication uh, through Teams uh, meeting, uh, which we had never done in the past, but we had to do during these unprecedented times. Um, financial stability of their family. Uh, it's, as I said before, it's a completely different profile of seafarers. And uh, for example, uh, Filipino seafarers, you may have one person that um, works on a cruise ship and then three, four families are supported back home. So you really, really have to understand uh, their psychology, uh, their, um, 
they are dependent on this job and you really need to um, uh, show empathy. So it's very important that during these times we try to uh, address this issue and promise that they wouldn't lose their jobs or that this uh, financial stability, which is not only them, because when I was on board I was single, it was not a big deal, but the families that they depend, their families that depend on that, uh, they have a certain, um, I would say, uh, job security and stability. And uh, loyalty also is, mer is, is, is very important. Uh, you need to show that you are loyal. When, when the, crew, the seafarers need you that the most, that's when you need to show that you are loyal. You don't desert them now that they need you the most. And you have to show support and understanding. And so uh, wrapping up, uh, we are as good as our people on board are. We don't do the job. The people on board do the job. So it's very important that we put the right people on board and we give them whatever support they need. We motivate them. Uh, we show them that we care so that they will do the job for us. Uh, I think this applies to many other areas, but it's also, I think we should also think how we would like to be treated if we were in their shoes. And um, sometimes what we don't understand is that they, we don't understand that seafarers have a certain life. They, uh, they go on board for six months and they plan that on the seventh month their niece uh, is going to get baptized or their brother is going to get married. So we need to uh, uh, be available when they want us. Uh, we need to show empathy uh, because, again, uh, they are away from their family and their loved ones, but they also have uh, lives going on. So we need to understand that we, we have to address their concerns as well because we would have the same concerns had we been in their shoes. And we have to show that we care and we have to explain. When I was on board, if, if, I, if I signed a six-month contract and for some reason I needed to extend, I, want, I wanted that somebody would explain to me that you need to extend because I did ABC and it did not materialize and I do apologize, but can you please extend for one more month because I don't have another option. So uh, we need to think and act like we would have liked to be uh, treated if we were on board. So. Um, especially these unprecedented times, this becomes even more important because there is more uncertainty. Uh, so they depend and they rely on us uh, more than uh, any other time and they don't have many options like they normally do. So that's why we need to be there for them and we need to show that we care. That's it. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. We thank you, Dimitris.